Hello, friends and colleagues. This is Jim Rice. I'm uh, going to be the moderator for this second in a series of four webinars. We're going to be exploring today some of the challenges and the opportunities to strengthen governance within some of the larger health systems across the United States. The challenge that we see moving into population health management, value-based payments suggests that if we'd done this webinar 10 years ago, we would only be looking at the challenge of governance and levels of governance within hospital organizations. But as we all know now, this governance has become more complicated, more complex when we're dealing with not only system governance, governance of hospitals, governance of medical groups, governing relationships across the continuum of care, even into the community. And so the challenge of big G governance is made more complicated. Big G governance being the structure of boards, the size of boards, the composition of boards and committee structures and the like, to small g governance, which is the art and science of engaging with multiple stakeholders and looking for new ways to not only engage but maximize and optimize communications among the different levels and the different parties in the governing of these health systems. So as you'll see on the title slide, we're going to be looking at balancing governance among system and local boards. And this is a part of a four-part series. Uh, we'll be looking at some of the common uh, roles and responsibilities of different boards within these systems and different governing groups and task forces and councils. We'll be look at, looking at how to operationalize these deceptively simple concepts of coordination and collaboration and communication. And we'll also be uh, providing you with a governance authority matrix, which looks at providing a structured way to stimulate conversations within your organization about who does what, who's got the, what degrees of accountability and responsibilities in different decision making in these larger systems. We're very delighted today to have join us in this conversation three experienced uh, friends and colleagues, many of you that are involved in this webinar know these three individuals. I'd like to start from right and move left with just the very briefest of introductions, and they will feel free to add embellishments as we go through our conversation. We're going to talk for about 30 to 35 minutes uh, around some key questions. Uh, each of the three will have an opportunity to share ideas and insights and experiences that they've had and some wisdom about how to improve the potential for the governance arrangements to be as effective and efficient as possible. We'll also have a chance for some questions from the registrants in the webinar, and we will finish the webinar in about 45 minutes, a quarter to the hour. So again, thank you all for joining us. Let me introduce you to Edie Eisenman. She served for a number of years in governance in the greater Detroit area with the Henry Ford Health System, Henry Ford Medical Group. She's recently uh, been retired to sharpen up her golf game, but is still engaged in advisory work for boards. To the left in the center of the slide, you'll see Larry Gage. Larry Gage is well known to many of you. He has a very active career. He's uh, a uh, attorney. He was a founder and guide for the original organization of public hospitals, now referred to as America's Essential Hospitals. He's of counsel with a, a large firm, and I enjoyed working with Larry on a number of different uh, projects. And he's actively involved in supporting boards and medical groups look at their governance arrangements and come up with practical ways to make them as effective as and efficient as possible. And then to our left, we see Susan O'Hare. Susan has uh, just recently formed and joined a partner in a human resources and talent development firm. She has worked with our group at the Integrated Healthcare Strategies in executive compensation and governance for 
a number of years, and prior to that was an executive within the Erlinger Health System, uh, also a chief executive in their children's hospital. Um, so three talented individuals that will take quite different perspectives on the challenge of system uh, governance and the relationships and the opportunities to enhance communication within those. Um, thank you, Susan and Larry and Edie, for joining us. Um, let's give each of you a chance just to say hello and uh, a comment about uh, your work interacting with boards, just uh, one or two sentences, starting with you, Susan, and then Larry, and then Edie. Good afternoon, everyone. We're delighted that you're joining us, and we hope you glean from our uh, collective wisdom at least a few little pearls to take home and to help you with your work. First of all, I think uh, my work has been largely in advising boards around executive compensation work and then governance structure, challenging um, as it is for even the smallest of hospitals in our, um, our, our country. The larger hospitals, I think it's getting even more challenging. And I've done a fair amount of work um, in compensation with organizations that have acquired new hospitals and merged. And I think um, I'll speak later to some of what I think um, I have become very passionate about around the challenges affecting some of those systems. Thank you, Susan. We know that many of the boards wrestle with how can compensation align behaviors of individuals and groups in these systems as well. Larry, perhaps just some brief additional comments on your perspective, please? Sure. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Jim, uh, and uh, welcome to all of you. I, uh, as Jim said, I've had a, a quite a long career uh, going back to the Carter administration uh, and uh, started the National Association of Public Hospitals in um, 1981 and ran that organization for 30 years and during that period and since uh, retiring from that job I have done a lot of work uh, with both public and nonprofit hospitals primarily around the country uh, helping to form health care systems working on issues related to uh, governance and legal structure um, pleased to work a year or so ago with uh, Edie and her role at, uh, in Detroit, uh, as, as well as with Jim on the team uh, to do a, a top-to-bottom governance review. And uh, in, in the course of doing that, uh, we conducted a survey of uh, large, nine large, very successful health systems around the country, some of whom may be represented on, uh, among the participants in this call, and a number of the observations I think I'm going to make are drawn from uh, the results of that survey. Thank you, Larry. And I know that you've been working with colleagues that are in-house counsel in some of these systems to continue that conversation and that learning among each other going forward. Edie, uh, thank you again for taking time to join us. Uh, any further comments on your insights for this webinar? Um, well, and my role is um, Vice President and Chief Governance Officer for Henry Ford Health System. I um, provided leadership for for boards, the health system board and advisory hospital boards and the insurance division board. So I think I have um, some firsthand knowledge about um, about trustees and how they feel about their role, um, both in quality and in various other areas. And I'm I'm very pleased to participate on this call. Thank you. Let's jump into the webinar. The first uh, area that I'd like each of you to share some insights are, as you look at these larger systems, what are some of the challenges that are likely getting in the way of them being as effective and as efficient as they would like this journey into population health, into accountable care and value-based pay? Just adds more complexity, it seems to me, on levels of governance. I'd like to start with you, Edie, just uh, what do you see to be a couple of the key challenges, and then maybe Larry will go to you and then to Susan, uh, as you look at some of the challenges uh, going forward. Edie? Well, I think that um, advisory boards um, particularly feel in some ways disconnected in terms of um, the direction of the health system they sometimes feel they have no voice into um, into what the direction is, what goals are being set, 
um, and 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 really struggle in terms of of indeed what their role should be. So, in addition to role clarity, we do see this issue of uh, subsidiary boards or advisory boards, uh, local hospital or institutional boards. One of the challenges is how do we get them engaged and connected. We'll come back to that as well, but that's a, a good challenge to put on the table. Larry, as you've worked with systems, what would be additional challenges that you think we have to keep in front of us? Larry? Well, I had you on mute. I'm terribly sorry. Uh, one, uh, I was saying that one, uh, Really, it's an adjunct to what Edie just said. Um, in a system, particularly a geographically dis dispersed system, uh, the uh, the need for consistent communication um, of, of policies, of procedures, of uh, the system's strategic vision, um, in light of, uh, of all of these new uh, demands uh, on on hospitals all over the, the country and including the uncertainty about the future of you know health reform and, and, and the rest. I, I think it's it's a real challenge to have that kind of effective communication and E D articulated one aspect of that with in terms of keeping an advisory board that may be located hundred miles away or maybe out in the suburbs uh, in in the loop. And I think I we have seen a, a number of strategies. Um I think you need to take a, a take them together rather than you know, treating them individually, and I'm sure many of you uh, use them, but uh, you know, probably the, the, the one that is the least effective is to have the senior management and the leadership and the trustees of the system be solely responsible for, uh, for this communication because that frankly ends up taking so much time and really eats into the time uh, both the trustees and the management need to if they have to go out and repeat the same message over and over in different forms across the system. Um, electronic communications, of course, uh, you know, we're in the age of social media and the internet and intranets. Uh, um, some systems have found them to be very helpful. Uh, actually having a designated governance officer and a staff, like the staff that Edie Eisenman ran at, at Henry Ford Health System, uh, I think is also a hallmark of, of successful systems. And then finally, uh, just sharing the responsibility for communication, making sure people are on the same wavelength. Uh, one of the systems we surveyed used a chain of command approach where each individual in senior management and, and actually each trustee on the system board had a responsibility to keep designated elements of the system up to date on on what, how the system was responding uh, to, to issues of, of quality and health reform and competitive challenges. Well, you mentioned a couple of important things there, Larry. One is this idea of vision. If we all share a same vision, the communication, the coordination are likely to be improved. Uh, we'll need to explore a little bit further in this webinar how are you, the three of you, looking at uh, different techniques to make sure that there is ownership of the same vision. You also talk about time, uh, the potential for staff to burn out going to too many board meetings, which is one of the challenges we see in some of these systems as well. So we'll come back to those good points that you're adding into the mix, Larry. And first I want to go to you, Susan, as you've looked at some of your work with systems, what do you see to be some of the, the challenges or obstacles that might be getting in the way of these systems working as smoothly as they would like? I think one of the things that we, I would step back and say is, and, and that is understanding what it is we're really supposed to govern as a board as it relates to value-based care or population health management in the risk environment that we're in today. I think if you're a board member, you're challenged to understand what that means. Goodness, you, re, you look at the paper, read the news, you know, every day, and that can mean something different in six months than what we're looking at today, and everybody's challenged by that right now to understand where is healthcare reform going to go, and therefore, what do we need to be looking at? What do we need to be governing? What do we need to make sure that we're paying attention to? And I see that, have seen that difference in organizations as they look at executive compensation 
um, incentive plans. And everybody's on a different journey related to population population health management, and that journey looks different even within the system for the different hospitals. The main mothership of hospital might be at one particular place in a community hospital that was just um, aligned with the system six months ago is in a very different place. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges that I see boards struggling with is how do we manage that? Well, not only how we're governing the base business, but how do we create a culture where we're pulling the oars together in that journey? We'll come to that also. Um, Larry and Edie, um, you made some comments about the dispersed boards or the geographically remote boards. The dynamic tension is that the local community leaders that serve on those boards, they not only want to know what's going on, but they want to have influence over their own affairs. Um, how, what would be examples of tension points that you've seen where local board feels like they're not empowered or engaged enough, not getting enough information, and on the system board, uh, sometimes them, they may be feeling that the decision-making process is so cumbersome with so many people involved that it takes too much time in this era where we need rapid uh, decisions and wise decisions, how do you balance that tension between the need for local meaningful engagement and still keeping things as streamlined as possible? First you, Larry, Larry and then uh, Edie. Sure. Uh, I mean, I, one, of, one of the systems we surveyed, uh, probably financially one of the most successful uh, actually did away with all local boards. Um, they have informal advisory boards and, of course, a medical staff structure. Um, but so there, is an, there, are, there are extremes here. Uh, I happen to believe that if, if it's carefully managed, uh, the use of, of boards that are largely advisory at the, at the local level uh, can bring a community's voice to bear on the decisions that are made by the entire system. Um, but I'm, I also believe there could be too much governance um, and, and such a thing. And I, I don't, you know, it, it, it is a balancing act. Uh, it, there are relatively few um, sort of system critical issues uh, in a system um, that, you know, where the decisions are going to be made at the, at the local level uh, in a system. It, it, that's the reason the system has come together in the first place. Um, but I, I do think that there's one example, uh, for example, is a, a system out west that um, looked around after it had assembled itself through several mergers and acquisitions and found it had something like 27 affiliate organizations with 55 different corporations. Uh, and they, they discovered that Simple decisions that often actually require 20 stages of decision making before they could be implemented. And they basically restructured into five regional boards, which I think is one effective technique, and one system board. And I think they are one of the most successful nonprofit systems in the country today. So the regional boards really fulfill the role of community based boards uh, in that system. And I think that there are some approaches to regionalizing and streamlining that can leave the community's voice intact. Well, and conceivably those regional boards would be organized around a health service marketplace. So some of the referral patterns and the coordination of care hopefully could be enhanced by that. Edie, I want to have you respond um, as you looked at the roles of the local boards inside of a system like Henry Ford. I know that you identified two or three key responsibilities that you wanted to make sure they were aware of and were able to accomplish. How, how do you define some of those key roles that would be happening at the local hospital board level? Well, I think certainly um, advisory boards have a, especially hospital advisory boards have a role in, in um, ensuring um, that the quality of care provided is um, outstanding for ensuring that that um, that the hospitals are making improvements in terms of 
quality metrics and value-based care. Um, I also think they have a role to play in um, in the community and um, engaging community leaders in various activities. For example, um, um, as is the case all over the United States, um, the hospital boards and, and the communities we serve um, are, um, are, are aware of the opiate addiction problem and um, they have um, engaged various, hospitals have engaged various community organizations, the police, the community health department, and so forth to develop strategies um, to address that issue. I think that's um, a role for community hospital boards. Um, and I think um, they have a role to play in evaluating um, the leadership, the CEO um, of the community hospital, where I think the tension um, is, as Larry mentioned, um, having advisory boards think they have a role in, in large system decisions such as um, the budget, the operating budget. I think, you know, that's, um, those decisions are made at a system level and, and especially at Henry Ford Health System, I think, Boards have been um, advisory boards have been have been very um, irritated that the system sets their target and then they have oversight or so they think of the financial performance and yet they don't believe in the in the operating income target that they've been provided. So I think first of all, in the roles and responsibilities document for advisory boards, those duties that the system or the responsibilities the system wants them um, to take on should be clearly spelled out. And they need to understand that from the beginning because otherwise they think they have a role into, into issues they don't. So, um, so I Those think are good it's, points. Yes, I think for it's sure. com community, quality, um, physician relations as well. Well, and the clarity of roles at the beginning, uh, it's very difficult to build trust and engender enthusiasm if people aren't clear on those roles. You also just made a comment about physicians, and I want to turn to you, Susan. In your career, you've worked, uh, of course, extensively with physicians. You're a senior officer for a children's hospital. You've worked in a system. How do you, what advice would you share with uh, people on this webinar about how you engage physicians into these local and system level decision making for governing the broader enterprise. How do you get that physician engagement? What would you encourage people to think about? Well, that's definitely a challenge. I think physicians are harder than um, executives to govern, uh, as, as you would say. One of the things that I have found that has been the most successful, and this was an organization um, that I worked with, was to engage physicians at, um, at an advisory board level in the organization around two things, community benefit and quality, and make the physicians really the owners of that along with community board members. This organization that was successful at this did it in an effort to really make a distinction between what the corporate board was going to govern related to strategic decisions, finance, um, anything related to that. But when it came to something like capital budget, for instance, they allowed the community benefit committee or advisory committee that they called it, they had several names for it, they allowed that group to weigh in on anything that related to a quality effort and particularly at the local level. So that much like what just what Edie just said, which I agree with you completely, those advisory boards can feel so disengaged if they don't know exactly what their role is. But to bring physicians into at what they consider a board level function to seek their input, to put them at the table with their colleagues and let them hash out um, some of the important quality decisions for the organization, I think is the best thing that you can do. And then the second thing I would say is be willing to say no. 
We are, as executives, are so concerned when we can't tell every physician yes. And the reality is we can't. And so I think that we have to be very open and honest with them and be willing to say no when we have to do that. Thank you. I want to spend just a few minutes with each of you on making some observations about the whole challenge of streamlining. Uh, we have this tension that we've just acknowledged about local operating boards or advisory boards and system boards. Uh, there's a, a very clear movement, however, to try and have fewer boards, smaller boards, and yet still have competencies that you need engaged in the decision process. Many health systems are working in very diverse communities. So a question for each of you is how do you, when we're trying to streamline the numbers and the size of boards and yet still get the diversity that we're looking for in, and the responsiveness of the health services, what are the structures or the strategies or the style that are going to help us get that balancing working as best as possible. Larry, um, you've seen this yourself. You've uh, looked at a number of systems. How do you balance this streamlining and yet still a sense of diversity and engagement among these boards? Uh, sure. Uh, it's a very good point and, and you know, can be a concern. Um, I, I, don't, I think it's important not to confuse just raw board size with access to diversity and diverse insights or even the need for diversity in board membership. Um, very often larger boards have come together sort of haphazardly over the years as a result of, of mergers, of acquisitions, uh, without a whole lot of attention to issues like diversity. Frankly, they, they may end up being diverse simply because of their size, but um, it doesn't mean that they're effectively able to take advantage of that diversity. In fact, I found that larger boards tend to be dominated uh, by a few vocal board members, uh, board officers. Uh, often you delegate more decisions in a large board to an executive committee uh, than you would in a smaller board, which is able to del deliberate and act more as an entire board. Uh, and then smaller boards. Uh, can still include substantial diversity, but you you have to pay careful attention to the recruitment process. Uh, the, the most successful boards, from a diversity perspective, you know, use use tools, a, a matrix of, of skills and background and interests that are currently represented on the board, so they can identify gaps, so that as slots come available, it isn't just you know who, who I know, you know who do I know who might make a good board member. There's an active recruitment process involved. Uh, Edie used a, a matrix like that, I think, very successfully with um, both the system board and a number of boards in, in across the Henry Ford system. And then you can pay attention to filling gaps, and you, some boards find that several gaps can be filled with a single appointment, um, and you, you can get the kind of diversity of just of experience and of, of advice that, that you really need in a large board. And then finally, you can look externally. You don't need to have all of the expertise uh, sitting there around the board table. In fact, that's not always a good idea. You can you can look to your medical staff. You can look to uh, advisory committees uh, that are ad hoc committees that may be formed to look into a particular issue. Uh, you can look to individual experts. Um, just one board in our survey set aside a period in every board meeting for about an hour, hour and a half for an external presentation, bringing speakers in from around the country. Now, this is a board that only met quarterly, so they were able to set aside the time uh, in, in what amounted to a day and a half long board meeting. But uh, you can accommodate a lot of advice uh, in a smaller board. Edie, if you could just make some brief comments. So uh, getting the talent and the expertise that you want into the governance decision making is uh, very much a part of the recruitment that Larry just talked about, but I know you spent a lot of time and effort and money, frankly, trying to continually enhance the onboarding or the orientation or the ongoing education of board members at all levels. Can you just in a couple of sentences share a little bit about some of the education efforts that you did in the system at all levels? 
Well, certainly we um, had a system-wide orientation for all new trustees and then asked that each advisory board have a separate orientation um, for those folks. We also have an annual um, educational session for trustees across the system. We have an annual quality retreat, which um, we bring in uh, speakers from outside to talk about the important role the board plays in, in quality and safety. And actually, um, that was expanded, was focused mostly on quality committees across the system for the first few years. But um, this past year, I think they invited trustees from all boards across the system. In addition to that, I would say that um, Henry Ford Health System has educated trustees, particularly about quality and safety, by inviting them to participate in um, patient safety huddles and rounding, where they can see firsthand the impact some of the um, quality issues have on, on patients. Thank you, Edie. We only have a few more minutes. I want to try and focus that into this issue of role clarity and role responsibilities in systems, how they uh, vary uh, at different levels. And also looking out into the future, uh, getting each of you to speculate a little bit about what you think might be happening in terms of size of boards, structures, and styles of interaction. But first, Susan, I, I want to go back to your comments um, about some of the engagement uh, uh, with communities and getting that sense of ownership. I know that when you're an executive of the Children's Hospital, they do a good job of bringing families in. They're not on a board, but they provide insights about needs, about uh, whether the services are being delivered properly. How do you think systems in the future are going to engage with communities, both at local board levels or advisory boards or focus groups, and how do you get that up into the system board for them to make wiser investments and uh, system design questions being more clear and accomplished? For many years, children's hospitals across the country have had family advisory boards or family advisory committees. I've seen both terms used. And they really bring parents in that have children uh, that had chronic illnesses, that have had many interactions at a lot of different levels with the health system. And they, they listen, they seek their advice, and they often ask their opinion about changes that they're going to make in health system procedures. I think that's a great lesson that e adult systems could take away. It doesn't need to be a children's hospital. It can be any adult system that, that does that. I also think that as we go forward, the challenges that we have around population health management cannot usually be met even with some of our larger health systems, if we only look internally. We have to look outside at the partnerships we have in our communities. Um, Edie mentioned the um, opioid crisis that's going on and working with local law enforcement. Think about housing crises that we see that we know are impacting disease and illness in many of our larger communities. And the work that we have to coordinate with social service organizations in our community. I think that's where boards of the future are going to be challenged because you're going to be governing the system as it interfaces with entities that you don't control. And that's an uncomfortable place for a traditional board member of 20 years ago, 15, even 10 years ago to be. And I think that's a place we as board members and executives must get to. Do you think, Larry, that we will have more conversations in the future about this idea of just-in-time governance? So, I mean, we still need governing body, common law. The IRS requires people to hold in trust a community asset. They govern that on behalf of the community, but Susan's bringing up another point that maybe we need some different vehicles that start and end. There's a sunset provision. It's not a structured ongoing board, but many, many 
different vehicles. How do you look at that going out into the future, Larry, different ways to interact with and govern these organizations that are enjoying with the systems? Uh, yeah, very good point. As, um, as boards have become more streamlined and as systems have become more streamlined and, and shed, you know, what I think of as unnecessary layers of, of, of governance, uh, I, I do think that uh, the, the creative use of um, ad hoc uh, governing entities uh, is going to continue to increase. Um, uh, we've addressed this, and, and I think Edie should comment as well, but in the governance review we did at Henry Ford Health System, where they've made very effective use over the years of ad hoc governance committees, and by their nature, ad hoc committees uh, should have a, uh, a, a sunset provision built into them. Uh, I think the best example of ad hoc governing committees I've seen in several places around the country have been in the implementation of, of information systems. Uh, the, uh, several of the systems that I'm most familiar with have, have implemented EPIC, uh, which is often a two to three year process that involves virtually every part of a, of a system and to have an ad hoc committee with expertise that doesn't need to be present on into the future on the board to, to oversee um, something like that or to oversee the, um, uh, the, the merger of two co-equal entities where you need very specialized skills um, or to, for a variety of other purposes um, I think is a, is a useful tool. Good. We have one question that's come in that's uh, a bit challenging. They've said, we've been talking so far about service delivery and coordination uh, in these systems, but <clears throat> apparently this person acknowledges that some of the systems are bringing in their own financing arrangement. They have their own health plan or accountable care organization, or they're doing a joint venture with an insurance group. Edie um, and Larry, you both worked within Henry Ford, which has its own um, largely Medicaid, but HMO. Uh, I wonder if you could uh, make some comments about added tension or the balancing of decision-making and governing across service delivery side of the family and the insurance or risk management side. First, some brief comments, Edie, Edie and then we'll go to you, Larry. Yes, yeah, the Henry Ford Health System has a, um, an insurance division, which, by the way, isn't largely Medicaid. It's um, Medicaid, Medicare, and, and commercial. Good. And and there there is a great deal of tension between the health plan and the delivery side, and and um, and the goals set on the delivery side don't always match the goals set for the insurance division and vice versa. And I think that um, the fact that um, our, the health system, Henry Ford Health System CEO sits on the insurance division board as an ex officio, the CEO of Health Alliance Plan attends health system board meetings. I think some of that tension gets resolved in those ways, not all. Some of it has to be worked through, I think, between the leadership of the health of the health plan and with the physician leadership of the health system, there there is certainly a delicate balance there that that gets out of balance many times. Yes, thank you. I apologize, Larry. I won't have you respond to that particular question that surfaced. We only have about five minutes. I've just moved the slides to a document that people can download. It's about a 20-page document. It's a uh, called a governance authority matrix. Uh, we've seen in larger systems to stimulate the conversation about who has which responsibilities, what degree of decision-making authority exists in these nine areas, strategic planning and the mission in the upper left-hand corner, physician economic relations, management oversight, financial vitality, all of these have a number of issues that encourage discussion about 
the degree of control and the relative responsibilities. With this slide in front of us, I want us to just give each of you a chance to make us some closing observations as we look out into the future for systems. What counsel, advice, uh, suggestions would you encourage the participants to keep in mind as they try to balance the roles and responsibilities between local boards, local advisory committees, the executive teams at local institutions, the corporate uh, system boards, the committees at the corporate level, and the executives at the corporate level in some of these areas. Because we've already acknowledged many difficulties and challenges, uh, understanding and embracing the mission, getting communications, getting a sense of coordination, but in, at the root of this is understanding and embracing role clarity. I want to first turn to you, Susan, for just any comments and observations that you would encourage board leaders at both local or system to keep in mind in this realm of, uh, of clear authorities. And then we'll turn to you, Edie, and then we'll close with you, Larry, to wrap this webinar up. So, Susan, as it relates to role clarity, what observations or closing comments would you like to share on this webinar? First of all, I think you must be have some sort of an authority matrix or structure that is written down so that everyone knows which board, which advisory committee has what level of responsibility and authority. So that's the first thing. Second of all, in the future, I think that boards are going to have to have a tremendous more a, a tremendous amount of moral courage they haven't had in the past. I think they will have to be strong risk takers, which we haven't traditionally done so well in healthcare. And figure out through all of this, keep all of this in mind that the nimbleness of decision making is critical for uh, the success of the organization. I would close with these words. Be open, honest, and direct early and often. Wise counsel. Thank you, Susan. Edie, as, you, um, as we try to wrap up some of this very admittedly short webinar on system governance in this realm of uh, clarity of responsibilities, what observations would you make in closing comments that you'd share with the audience? Well, I absolutely agree that an authority matrix is is um, required. Henry Ford Health System did not ha does not have an authority matrix, and so I think the um, there's not clarity around what the board needs to make decisions about versus what management makes decisions. I think it's important for for us to clarify all roles within the organization, and I think that's key to success. Thank you, Edie. Thank you for your years of service there, and I know that you're available for education and consultation uh, with systems as well. Uh, thank you very much for joining us and for your comments. Larry, I'd like to turn to you for some of your closing observations on anything that we've talked about, but certainly on clarity of responsibilities. Um, sure, Jim. I actually want to come back to the, the one question from the participant and uh, really, as an example, uh, the, the the notion that systems have become both more uh, both vertically and hor horizontally integrated, with uh, many systems having uh, managed care products, affordable care organizations, accountable care organizations, and the like, uh, assuming more risk. I think it's easy to lose sight of what what you need to align around, uh, particularly, I guess, in the nonprofit and, and in the governmental sectors, which I'm most familiar with. Uh, and that's really the, the vision has to be around the patient and the community. And to if, if you have alignment around that as your primary motivating vision, I, I think um, you're going to be able to make effect, more effective use of an authority matrix because it's uh, the strategic planning for what is the question. And then the second point I would make is, is sort of by whom. And I think one issue that we've skirted around a little bit uh, is that uh, it's extremely important to, uh, to build into the recruiting process for, for management, for physician leaders and trustees, um, uh, uh, characteristics that 
in addition to professional excellence, which is really a starting point, uh, characteristics that lend themselves to individuals who are going to who are going to align themselves around the, the vision of uh, of, a, of a serving the community and, and serving the patient population and improving health. Uh, characteristics like empathy and good listening skills, history of teamwork and, and the like. It's what Ron Anderson, who uh, late CEO of uh, Heartland, used to call servant leadership skills. Uh, because all of this could go down the tubes if, if you have even just one rogue trustee uh, or, or you know, the chair of medicine who uh, is really constantly crossing the line between management and governance or believes they were appointed to their position uh, to, to represent a particular constituency. Uh, so I, I think that that's an extremely important, there's, not, uh, there's sometimes nothing you can do about existing board members until their terms are up, but you've got to pay attention to who you're putting in leadership positions uh, for the future. It's a good point to end this webinar on the embrace of servant leadership within board members and executive and position leadership will become even more important in the future. Susan, thank you. Larry, Edie, thank you all for joining us. I would remind you that you can download uh, a blank uh, governance authority matrix for your use. I would also encourage you to realize that we're going to do two more webinars, one coming up on June 7th, where we're going to be looking particularly at board physician relationships, and the final webinar will be looking at how new technologies can support improved and more in efficient uh, decision making among the governing boards. We've been focusing today on uh, governance within systems. We hope that you had one or two ideas there shared from our experienced and expert panel. Thank you again, panelists, for joining with us. If you have follow-up questions, uh, you can please reach out to me. We'll make sure if you have more questions for either Edie Eisenman, Larry Gage, or Susan O'Hara that we can direct them to you as well. Thank you all for taking the time and for being interested at how our systems in this nation can improve by having more effective governance arrangements. The webinar is adjourned.